morning everyone. Welcome to the webinar on test FCA correlation of uh, cast aluminum gearbox casing. Uh, before I begin this webinar, I would like to draw your attention to um, one point. Uh, this year, we are planning to do a webinar series around uh, two uh, themes. One is on vibration and uh, we'll be showing several uh, case studies on uh, vibration and uh, there is going to be a webinar on March 16th following this, following this there is a webinar in April there is a webinar in, on 4th of May and there is one webinar on 1st of June and uh, 6th of July uh, to stay updated about these webinars uh, we will send you emails also you can visit our website uh, there is a section on the website uh, which lists all the webinars that are coming up. We also have uh, webinars on the topic of finite element analysis. Next Friday we have a webinar on auto fritage simulation using finite element analysis. As you may know, auto fritage is a process that is used in in the production of uh, pressure vessels. So how do you uh, Simulate order fritage process using finite element method. That's the topic of the webinar. Okay. So let me uh, begin today's webinar right now. The topic that we're going to cover is uh, test to finite element analysis correlation, uh, specifically on vibration test uh, that was done on an automobile component, which is a uh, gearbox casing that's made from cast aluminum alloy. So there are three, three parts to my presentation today. To begin with, I will walk through the case study. So that gives a summary of uh, how the test was done, how the finite element analysis was performed, and uh, some of the key results, and uh, how do you correlate the test and finite element analysis results. Following this brief presentation, I'll show the actual case studies using uh, VMAP. So, before I do the demonstration, I would also give an introduction of what VMAP is and uh, how it is useful for doing vibration testing and uh, analysis of test data and correlation between test and the finite element analysis results. What you are seeing here in this picture is the component that we are going to show today. This is a gearbox casing. And uh, this shows a test configuration. There is an accelerometer which is mounted on the casing to record the vibration response. And with an impact hammer, we we ping the structure and uh, the response is measured. General outline of the next few slides, a description of the component, its finite element model, a description of experiment and key results, and uh, correlation of finite element analysis to test data. When we do correlation, we also talk about modal parameters and uh, modal assurance criteria. Initially, the picture here shows the finite element model of the gearbox casing. Three key aspects of the model. Three key aspects. The mesh was with uh, 10 node tetrahedral elements, and uh, there are 20,000 nodes and uh, 69,000 elements. Material, as I already mentioned, this casing is made of cast aluminum alloy with a density of 4,000 kilograms per meter cube, modulus of 51 10 power 9 newton per meter square, and a Poisson's ratio of 0.33. The Analysis was done with free free boundary conditions. This slide lists the results from the finite element analysis that was performed. What we are interested in is modal analysis. What we are interested in, we want to find out what are the resonant frequencies, mode shifts, and damping of this component. And uh, when we do the finite element analysis, we get the resonant frequencies and uh, mode shifts we would model damping. But with the real component, with an experiment, you can measure damping as well. So we'll talk about that 
when we get to the experimental section of the case study. So these are the first two modes of the component and uh, the values are 573.89 hertz and 939.9 hertz. This is the third resonant frequency, the deflection shape for that, fourth resonant frequency, the deflection shape for that, fifth resonant frequency and the deflection shape. Following the finite element analysis, he went ahead, took the component and did a couple of experiments on the component. One experiment was done where we measured the responses using an accelerometer, which can measure the vibration response at any given point in x, y, and z direction, what we refer to as a triaxial accelerometer. And when you measure, you get the vibration at several locations, and then you do some post-processing on the data that is recorded as a function of time, and you derive these two plots, that is frequency response function. There are two graphs here. One is the amplitude as a function of frequency. The other graph is phase as a function of frequency. I'll show this in more detail when I show a live demonstration of this data as being analyzed in VMAP software. The second type of experiment that we did, instead of using accelerometers, we used non-contact vibration measurement technology, which is laser vibrometer. But before I get to the data from laser vibrometer, let me talk about some analysis that was done on this data that was measured using accelerometers. Looking again, this is amplitude of vibration measured in terms of frequency response function, function of frequency. Then you have phase as a function of uh, frequency. There are two peaks in this graph. The peaks occur at 86.79 hertz, and the second peak happens at 939.48 hertz. And wherever there is a resonant frequency in the phase plot, also you will see each. Now, okay, there are these two peaks, but then it's important to get the frequency and the damping values uh, precisely. And uh, that is where the curve fitting techniques are used. It's the form of parameterization where the parameters that you want to extract from the frequency response functions are what we refer to as modal parameters. They are three in number. One is resonant frequency, or we refer to as mode or natural frequency. Second is damping. In this slide, you see this as Q factor. From Q, Q factor, you can get damping. Third is mode shape. So for these two peaks, we use the rational fraction of fitting and extract the two modes. One is at 586.79 hertz, and the other is at 939.48 hertz. And for those two modes, we get the Q factors. One is 44.48, other is 149.41. The third modal parameter that is extracted when we do curve fitting is mode shape. So you have experimental model analysis and finite element analysis. We are looking at first mode and uh, second mode, the correlation of the mode shape. It will be far more clear when I show a live demo and the deflection videos. And then correlation is captured using <coughs> model criteria. This shows the experimental model analysis on one side, finite element analysis on the other side and uh, MAC. So you have 0.94, there's a 94% correlation between test and FEA, and then an 88% correlation between test and FEA for the second mode. Laser vibrometer. I mentioned there were two ways in which we went about capturing the vibration data and then analyzing them to get the resonance frequencies and damping and mode shape. The second method that we used was laser vibrometers, so we get the frequency response function, the amplitude and uh, phase plot, similar to what you saw as results from the accelerometer. The reason you are seeing so many plots is, is very simple, we measured it many more times than we measured laser vibrometer, because it's detected with uh, uh, robotics, so there is a robot which holds the uh, laser sensors and it can scan the component really fast. So. 
the data that I showed you earlier was done manually and it was measured at 14 locations. The data that you are carrying at right now was captured at nearly 700 points and with uh, X, Y and Z directions we are looking at nearly 2000 graphs in this uh, picture. Here again we repeat the process. There are two differences in this graph. Uh, one of them of course is we have many more measurement locations. The other is the frequency change of measurement in this case was higher because we used a smaller uh, automated in the hammer. What that means is it could have a flat frequency uh, response uh, for a higher frequency range. So in the previous uh, measurement we went only up to 1000 hertz so we could capture only two resonant frequencies. Here we could go up to 5000 hertz so we were able to capture 19 resonant frequencies. Out of the 19 I am picking the first five frequencies of interest to us and uh, doing fitting with the resonant frequency, few factors and mode shape. So in this chart you are looking at the first five resonant frequencies and the technique that is used for model parameter extraction, the extracted modes and the corresponding damping values captured in terms of Q factor. And we should show you the deflection shapes, the correlation between test and FEA, the visual correlation. The first mode, the value is here and the corresponding deflection shapes. The experimental model analysis is shown on the left side and FEA is shown on the right side. This is the third mode and the fourth mode and the fifth mode. Now we want to look at numerical correlation is measured in terms of model assurance criteria. For the first five modes, we have more than 80% uh, max. For the first mode, we have 99% correlation. Second mode, we have 96% correlation. Third mode, 93%. Fourth mode, 89%. Fifth mode, 80%. Uh, this is very good correlation. I mean, these, uh, the benchmark on which you would say it's very well correlated could vary. But in general, in automotive industry across um, projects and uh, uh, use cases, what we have seen is above 80% max, you could say that's okay. A reach good convergence and good correlation between test and uh, FEA vibration data, and you can move on. Then comes the follow up question, which is if the correlation is not good, what do you do? That's when the process of model updating comes in. When you go and modify a fine element model uh, automatically in several cases, you, you get a good correlation between test and FEA. But that's not the topic of today's uh, uh, presentation. So this is a summary of this uh, case study on gearbox casing where we did model analysis and uh, I'm showing the fine element analysis results test and test that was conducted in two ways. Let me um, show, go to the second and third parts of the presentation. I want to take this data and uh, show you how it is actually analyzed. But before that, to set the context more clearly, I would like to walk you through the, what is MEMAP? There are a few slides on MEMAP. MEMAP is Vibration Measurement and Analysis Package. It's an experimental model analysis and uh, FEA test correlation software product of tech passion. It has two parts to it. One is the data acquisition part and the other is the analysis and correlation part. So you can use VMAP to do all kinds of experimental model analysis. Uh, it could be with hammer or shaker. It could be single input, single output, single input, multi-output or multi-input, multi-output test. And the second part of the VMAP software is its, is its analysis capabilities. So once you have test data, you do parameterization using curve fitting algorithms to extract model parameters. Following this, you can import finite element analysis data and do correlation between test and FEA. And there are also model updating capability built in uh, VMAP, which interacts with uh, finite element analysis software to update your finite element model when there is a lack of correlation between test and FEA. VMAP as I showed in the case study, Vima has the capability to import uh, data from the robotics integrated laser algorithm from Poly. So if you have non-contact measurement uh, uh, data from say rotating machinery, you could import that and analyze it using Vima. And there are a complete set of damping models which allows you to, uh, it serves as a bridge between the test and the uh, FPA. 
Because when you do FPA, you're getting natural frequencies and whole shapes. Damping is usually an input to FPA. So using your experimental data, you can extract the damping values, which can be fed as an input into your uh, finite element model. Another notable feature of EMAP is its capability to import data from other analysis software and uh, also other uh, test hardware. And that has enabled using compatibility with various uh, file formats. One of the significant ones is universal file format. And also the data from the EMAP may be exported to USF format. I want to draw your attention to the flow chart on the right side. This is this represents the life of a typical design engineer. You are given specifications. You come up with a component solid model. You conceive an idea, you conceive a um, design, and then if you are a, I'm keeping the focus around model analysis. You use finer element method to do model analysis, whereby you get natural frequencies and mode shapes. Then, when you have a physical component, you do experimental testing that gives you natural frequencies, mode shapes. It also gives you damping. Then you can correlate your test and uh, FP model. Following this, you can update your finite element model when there is a lack of correlation. You either just update the damping or you go update geometry, material properties. With an updated finite element model, you can do more detailed analysis on that, with calculation of life, transient analysis, so on. So out of these six steps, we now can be used in step two, three, and four. This is the robotics integrated laser uh, vibrometer sensor that I was talking about. What you are seeing in this slide is a Ford Mustang sports car. And using this uh, robotic laser vibrometer, uh, it's possible to scan this car for vibration. In less than eight hours, you can capture close to 8,000 points. Now, what do these numbers mean? Uh, historically, in the auto industry, at a, at a full car level, it's model analysis had to be performed, uh, the instrumentation, uh, setting up the test, acquiring data, and dismantling the test setup took about four weeks to capture 400 points. So 400 points in four weeks versus 8,000 points in eight hours, so 500 times gain in productivity. This is a, the scale of the art technology in uh, model analysis, and it's been developed by Polytech, and such rich data can add significant value to uh, the analysis uh, that you do, the design stage of a component. And VMAP can handle data of this uh, large size. So to give a flavor, when that card is fully scanned, you get a grid which looks as rich as this. So we are staring at the card body data, where all these points that are in red are the measurement points where we have captured data. Now, Laser agrometer technology can be used to measure vibration from rotating machinery uh, from hard surfaces because rotating machinery, it is, it's difficult to put uh, uh, accelerometers with cables coming out. Uh, though telemetry exists, it introduces inaccuracies because of the mass loading. But laser agrometer is a non-contact way to capture rotating machine vibration. Then hard surfaces, since accelerometers are sensitive to temperature, there is inaccuracy that creeps in. Uh, you don't have that problem with laser technology. Laser agrometer is also used in characterizing uh, MEMS device. EMAP has two very critical features. One is called test planner, which is an add-on uh, to plan your test based on finite element analysis results. And then there is test data manager, which allows you to take uh, a battery of test data uh, or results from a battery of tests that you would have done, like done with different different measurement locations, different operators, and uh, many other situations. And you want to do some statistical study on that. A product like Excel is not sufficient because you can just look at uh, numbers and plot some graphs. But here we are looking at getting more insights by looking at animation, uh, correlation views, and uh, essentially taking large volumes of test data and doing statistical studies on that. That's where test, man test data manager comes in. VMAP has an interface with Scilab software, which is an open source software alternative to MATLAB. So if you want to take VMAP and write some programs on top of that, you could do that. And um, it's compatible with all the leading uh, FES solvers that you may be used, Astra and Ansys, Abacus, Hypermesh, uh, the meshing package, and the radios. 
and the different types of uh, finite element models, uh, irrespective of what elements could be could be coded. When it comes to correlation between test and FEA data, there is model assurance criterion, there is COMAC, and frequency response assurance criterion which are built in VMAX. These correlation tools help you gain insight into the analysis that you would have done and the tests that you would have done. Okay. I want to take the uh, case studies and show it in VMAX. First, I want to import the test data. Following this, I want to import the... Okay, before I bring in the final model, let's just take a look at the test data. So... This is the complex mode indicator function. There are two peaks here, which are the resonant frequencies. Uh, what are the other kind of data that will be available? So this is an impact test. This is this that was given to the comment. And then you can look at the response that is measured at uh, um, different locations on the component. There are 14 nodes where the response was measured. Then there is FFT of stimulus. There is FFT of response. There are two peaks here. There is one resonant frequency. There is a second resonant frequency. Then frequency response function. Amplitude, frequency response function, phase data. Now, there are different coverages that are available in VMAP. Let me first show you a single degree of freedom coverting technique. So what we do in single degree of freedom coverting is we fit from this peaks, we want to extract the resonant frequency damping function to the first resonant frequency. When I do that, I get the resonant frequency and the Q factor. This is the second resonant frequency. These are single degree of freedom coverting with this. What I mean by that is uh, I took this peak it uh, performed the coverting and we got the resonant frequency and factor. Then we did it for the second peak. Now there is another method called least squares compound exponential uh, fitting. Here what we do is we can fit our square uh, frequency range. So first we do the region range order. Then we do curve fitting. It takes the frequency response function in their band and uh, performs the curve fitting. Okay, so that's done. So you would notice that an FRF has been generated for the entire spectrum. This is FRF amplitude and this is a curve fit amplitude. We can overlap them, especially near the resonances, they should match perfectly. This is what we are getting here. The uh, plot in green is the curve is done, and the plot in red is the measured data. Uh, this is for one of the nodes, and similarly for another node, this node, and so on. So, this is, uh, I showed you single-degree freedom curve fitting, I showed you multi-degree freedom curve fitting. 
Now we want to look at mode shades arrived from just uh, test data analysis. This is the first resonant frequency, 500. The second resonant frequency at 939.28 hertz. Now I'm going to bring in the other side of the story, which is the finite element analysis data. So we have the gear box cover. There is the result files. To the correlation between the two. This is the first resonant frequency. The first resonant frequency from uh, test is shown on the left side. First resonant frequency from uh, FEA is shown on the right side. You can see that visually they are, they are it looks like we are looking at the same, almost similar. But what's more important is to quantify the correlation between the test and uh, FEA. For that, we use math. I want to use data which I obtained just now. We have a 91% correlation between test and FEA for the first and 86% correlation between test and FEA for the second mode. This was the data that was acquired with uh, triaxial accelerometer. So in summary, for the data that I just showed you, we first go to the test data, we perform, we look at the graphs, perform the curve fitting to extract the resonant frequencies, adapting, and mode shapes. I showed you a correlation of test and uh, FEA mode shapes, visual correlation, and a numerical correlation using MAC. Now let me bring in the other case study, which is the same component, but the test was done with the robotic laser algorithm. I'm importing the data. This shows the gearbox power. At the 700 locations, we scan the, the component for vibration. And this is the measurement grade. I also want to import the geometry just to overlap on top of the CAD model. This is a model and the points marked in red have uh, measured vibration on the component. When I walk through the presentation of this study, I think that when we measured with laser vibrometer, we measured five up to 5,000 watts and we were able to capture uh, 19 resonant frequencies. So, with the laser, with the accelerometer data, uh, it had nothing to do with the accelerometer. It's just that the hammer that we used was uh, smaller when we used laser accelerometer. So we had a flat, flat frequency response for a higher frequency range. It could go up to five kilohertz. But then with the other experiment, we went only up to like one kilohertz. This is why we were able to see only two modes. Then we have the luxury of looking at more resonance. But I'm going to show the analysis and correlation for the first three modes. So, for one mode, I perform curve fitting. So, you get an idea of the richness of the data set that is possible today, and also the capability in we have to analyze uh, those kind of data.
For this resonant frequency, I want to perform curve with exact resonant frequency and motion. Think of that done. So, this is the FRF amplitude and this is curve fit amplitude. You can overlap the graphs. It will not show clearly if I look at the entire spectrum. Let's say one data set, we can look at it. What you are looking at is the plot in red is measurement data and plot in green is, plot in green is curve. And you get the resonant frequency and Q factor. That's analysis of the test data. So we can look at the mode case for this. This is the first mode. So when you look at the smoothness of an animation, it, it will look like you are looking at the results from finite element analysis. But no, you are actually looking at results from test data. This is the second mode. This is the third mode. Fourth mode and fifth mode. Now I want to bring in the finite element data, I can uh, do correlation between uh, test and the FEA. I've already imported the model, I want to import the results also. So now you can see experimental modes and also the finite element mode. So let me switch to the correlation view. On one side, we are looking at the animation from the FE. This shows the animation from uh, test. This is the second mode. The second mode. This is the third mode. Third mode. Fourth mode. from FEA. So as I walk through each of these modes, you will have noticed that the shapes look very similar. And uh, since we have more measurement location, there are some inaccuracies that you don't get because there is no mass loading. So for these reasons, you get um, higher fidelity data uh, using this technology. Now let's also look at MAC, the model assurance credit compared to the test in uh, FEA. Model analysis data. We have 100% for the first mode, 96% for the second mode, 93% for the third mode, 89% for the fourth mode, and 80% for the fifth mode. So, in summary, uh, for the laser agrometer data, first I imported the laser agrometer data. Measurement at nearly 700 locations, and we had vibration in x, y, and z directions recorded. We looked at the plot, and uh, we performed the RFP, that is the National Traction Polynomial Coupling, to extract resonant frequency, something in mode shape for one of the modes. Showed you mode shapes for test. We showed the correlation between test and FEA data after importing the FEA results. And now we are looking at MAC. In this case, we have good correlation. The modes are arranged neatly. There's not, there's, there is almost no coupling between modes. Uh, but in uh, several cases, modes may not be arranged in the same order between test and FEA. And uh, in such cases, there will be a need for doing model updating. That's not the scope of today's presentation. So. I'll stop here and uh, we'll take a few questions uh, in the next five minutes. But uh, if you have any uh, additional questions, uh, you can always send us an email and we will get back to you with the rest. The video of the webinar will be uh, sent to the registrants by email, to the participants by email. So for Q&A, uh, you can Type in your questions in the chat section and we will uh, respond to some of the questions depending on the time available in the next minutes. Thank you again for participating in the webinar.